Bun găsit, doamnelor, domnilor, sunt Marius Constantinescu. Astăzi, la ediție limitată, ne întâlnim cu două autoare de limbă engleză intensiv traduse și mult iubite, pentru că în scrierile lor ne întâlnim și nu ne mai săturăm de ele cu unele dintre cele mai seducătoare chipuri ale Parisului. Ele se numesc Jean Mackin și Mary McAuliffe, iar în România sunt publicate și traduse de editora Corint. Mary McAuliffe deține un doctorat la Universitatea Maryland, a predat la mai multe universități americane și a susținut conferințe inclusiv la Smithsonian Institute. A petrecut mult timp la Paris, iar astăzi își împarte experiențele literare și fotografice de acolo pe pagina de Facebook și pe blogul care îi poartă numele. Locuiește la New York alături de soțul ei, iar în scrierile sale, perioade precum cea a baronului Osman, la Belle Epoque sau Le Zanefol, reînvie cu vigoare și mult, mult farmec. At the turn of the century, Paris is undoubtedly and unquestionably the most fascinating city in Europe, if not the whole world. Why Paris and only Paris? Why Paris and only Paris? Yes. Oh, the people! The people, always, always the people. And that is what I focus on in my books. What wonderful people there were. And they weren't all Parisians. They were not all French. By this time, they were coming from all over. They were coming, you know, from Spain, Pablo Picasso, many others followed his steps. Eastern Europe were starting to come in too. You know, the Chagall and so many and forming the uh, Paris School of, of painters. It was a tremendous time. That is an art alone. There are so many fields where people Parisians, yes, but coming from all over to Paris. They just, it, it uh, gave birth to this, this wonderful yeasty, I call it, background where everything, people interacted, you know that happens. You get a, a collection of wonderful people and they draw other people and they communicate with each other and ideas form, you see. Are we talking about uh, one Paris with several faces or actually uh, different micro cities within its boundaries? Because if we think uh, of the difference between Montparnasse and Montmartre, for instance, there we could have, we could easily have two cities in one. You could. And you could also have another third city uh, around the western portions of Paris and those who formed in a, a group around uh, Diaghilev and Jean Cocteau. And Jean Cocteau was also in Montparnasse and he sort of go, went back and forth. But there was this third group, Coco Chanel would be in that in the 1920s and 30s, uh, a little more, a lot more conservative politically. Uh, and uh, very much formed around, uh, I would say, Diaghilev and the Ballet Russe. And that, that crowd. But that also attracted, of course, Stravinsky, naturally, and Picasso became a set designer for it. So these overlap, but yes, there were separate cities. And there's another sense of separate city, Marius, and that is not everyone in, par in Paris at that time was an artist yes. or a thinker or a writer. There were many, many people who were the bourgeois, and then below that there were the workers and many of those were suffering a great deal. What does Paris preserve from its Belle Epoque time uh, and um, uh, still uh, includes in its Anéfol? Oh, what a very good question. I would say I would focus more on change than on continuity. Okay. But there always is continuity, always. I mean, you have Monet, Claude Monet, who continues right on. He has started way back in the 1870s at the beginning of the Belle Epoque. He goes through those years of World War I. He, uh, and then he is still, he doesn't die until later into the, uh, into the 1920s, Les Années Folles. The so massive presence of Americans there in the first decades of the 20th century. How does that change the face of the city? I think it changed during the Les Années Folles uh, much more than before. Uh, the number of Americans before that was, was quite small. Yes. But afterwards, after the war, partly because there were so many American soldiers there and they remained or they went home and then they brought their families or their girlfriends with them. They had to see Paris. That was part of it, but also part of it. Um, there was a, uh, a, a huge number of steamship lines that provided steep, uh, cheap fares. These were the ones that used to bring immigrants to the new world and now they were bringing back Americans to the old world. 
uh, and these Americans wanted to see Paris. Well, all they saw really was Montparnasse. That's all they wanted to see, perhaps, perhaps Montmartre. Uh, and how did they change it? They took over, unfortunately, so many places. Montparnasse was not the same by the end of the decade, and many Parisians were fleeing. <laughs> Both periods of time uh, are mid-surrounded, uh, legendary uh, in the life of the metropolis with anecdotes, histories, and uh, also imagery still vivid uh, in, the, in the massive cliché capital that Paris epitomizes even today. What would be the rotten, or at least the unseen reverse of the story? This is what I tell everyone. Please do not go to the same old places in central Paris the tourist spots, the, the, the Tour Eiffel, do not, you can see that if you wish, go to the Louvre, go to the whatever in central Paris, but get out, get off the beaten path. Americans all want to go to the left bank. I say, no, go to the right bank, please. Go to the Marais, go to the area of the Bastille, Republique, and the, the, uh, the 11th Arrondissement, the 11th. Uh, which is where we stay. We have Marcel Proust, Sarah Bernard, Paul Poiret, Maurice Ravel, Pablo Picasso, Claude Debussy, Henri Matisse, Auguste Rodin, François Coty, Louis <laughs> Renaud, Jacques Guerlain, Marie Curie, Les Frères Lumière. Then later Ooh. on, we have Coco Chanel, Gertrude Stein, Man Ray, André Breton, Constantine Brunkusch, the Romanian born Constantine. Oh, yes, Brunkusch, we must El have Schiaparelli, Ernest Hemingway, Josephine Baker. Basically, everybody who's been somebody is to be found in Paris within yes. these decades, from this La Belle decade. Epoque up to the Les Années Folles. Well, and up to the war. Yes. Up to the occupation in Germany. After the war, it was different. And I will have to say, after the war, Paris is still a destination, but more for tourists. I think, I will have to say this, the artists, the center became New York. It is less so now. But I was going to ask you that because you also have Central Park, New York, as your background for today. And we are <laughs> talking about Paris. So we have Paris and New York, like two poles uh, dominating the first half of the 20th century. Yes. Yes. I like to, I, I, I was thinking of an image, George Gershwin coming to Paris to write his American in Paris. But at the same time, Maurice Ravel coming to New York to play concerts, and he and George Gershwin together, George Gershwin invites him to visit the Cotton Club in Harlem to hear jazz. Isn't that, isn't that a beautiful yes. uh, symbol? I like to see that. I like, would have liked to see that. But there always was this culture, this admiration for culture and admiration for the intellectual. I think also too, so many of, and I venture here on a, on a difficult territory perhaps, but so many of those who are writing, who are artists, and I speak of them uh, in these years, Andre Gide for one and many others, who were gay, who were homosexual, and they found that they did not have any shame in Paris, they were welcomed. And much as Josephine Baker, as a black, an American black, found a home in Paris. So they were welcome here, these outstanding people who may not have been welcome other places, especially in America, unfortunately. This kind of influence, and this, this resonated certainly with the wealthy upper classes of Americans, and these were the trend centers here. Communications, I think, makes a difference. Mm -hmm. You have the printing press, the rotary press, you have photography capturing so much of this, and newspapers and mass newspapers. So this spreads a lot of what was going on. Well, your books, I would say, are fiction in disguise because they are historically so accurate and well-documented, yet so easy and so, so pleasant to read with characters and yeah. situations that are equally fascinating. Um, where specifically in Paris? Do you like to wander um, uh -huh. in an imaginary addendum to your books? Oh, that's a lovely question. Uh, I can wander in my mind so okay. many Okay, yes, we all wander. <laughs> we, we all wander, wander in our minds today, yes. I will take you first to central Paris where I said stay out, but I will say no. 
Yeah. Take a walk down the former Pompidou Expressway, which has now been turned into a walkway along the Seine, and start down by the Pont de Sully, way in the uh, eastern part, and walk all the way along, right by the river, down below, and then you pass under the bridges, and then you pass by central Paris and the Conciergerie, you know, just all the thing, all the way down as far as you would like. And to the, to the Eiffel Tower. And that is a beautiful walk. And then, oh, I must go back into the little tiny back streets. Uh, I will, oh, I love the bakeries. Oh, <laughs> who doesn't, yeah. The food, yes. And I go down and I pick up in the morning, not a croissant, a, a croissants are good, but they do not fill me up. And I love the bread, oh, the bread is so yes. good. And the nice, heavy, hearty bread and our bakery, which is, Interestingly called, by, is by owned by a Michel Dupin, mm -hmm. good name. And he has a bread called the Cirque, because we are near the Cirque d'Hiver. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's a round loaf and full of good grains and moist and beautiful. And we get a slab of that and we bring it home. And, oh, it is so good. And then we walk. We will, where do we walk? <laughs> I, we have so many favorite walks, I cannot tell you. Uh, it depends what kind of a day. Is this the day we take the promenade planté? Uh -huh. From the day all the way out to the Bois de Vincennes? Mm -hmm. And there we can go on to the Lac Dominil. Each, by the way, the each of these wonderful forests on each side are, are parks on each side of Paris, which are gifts of Napoleon III, an authoritarian rule and I will have to say please don't forget my latest book I have to show you there yeah, it yeah. is Paris City of Dreams is this this no. is Donna the Valley Park. I'm sorry I have <laughs> well, whatever uh, Paris City of Dreams it's the Paris that we know and love today it was built but it was built under very harsh circumstances if you were to choose for a time capsule some human intellectual creations of both La Belle Epoque mm -hmm. and Les Années Fall what would you choose Oh, I'm an American, so I love Impressionist art. <laughs> okay. I love Monet. Um, actually, Debussy and, and Ravel, too. I, I, I am a musician, it, not a very good one, but I play the piano, and I love to hear, and my, my husband is in music, so uh, he works with symphonies. So we, we love that period very, very much uh, for the art, the music, uh, Stravinsky. <laughs> <laughs> so much. So we add in this time capsule some some uh, lilies from Monet and maybe oh, yes. the the bolero from Ravel and Le Sacre de Printemps, uh, Stravinsky's. Uh, absolutely, absolutely. And maybe some literary work as well. Ah, Proust. Proust. Proust definitely. definitely. We were talking earlier about the Great uh, War, uh, World War I, uh, and uh, we must not forget that um, its boundaries also uh, coincide up to a certain extent uh, with the Spanish flu. Uh, oh. Now, today we are living quite similar times, unfortunately, and I was wondering not to finish this interview uh, in, a, in a lower note, yes, on the downside, but uh, quite the opposite. Are we to expect, after these pandemic times, uh, a new revival of Les Années Folles? I, I think that is an excellent question, and I have thought about that, and I think we may be in for that. Yes, very much so. In fact, some people behaving in ways in this country, certainly, that don't make a lot of sense right now, uh, because they can't wait to get out, and they can't wait. They're almost exploding. Yes, I know. I it's you know, happening this, here as well. This explosive period, period, and here, I am very good. My husband, we, we wear our masks, we double mask and all that, but, uh, and here in New York, people are very good, but elsewhere, not so good. But that is another question. You are asking about behavior in general, and I think, yes, people will sort of go, ah, like that, and I think there will be some of that, yes, very much. <laughs> Thank you.
Rivalele spune povestea unei discordii legendare a primei jumătăți a secolului 20, cea între două creativități antagonice și în același timp între două estetici fundamentale pentru evoluția modei internaționale, cea între Elza Schiaparelli și Gabriel Coco Chanel. Jean Mackin documentează minuțios toată această perioadă și o face cu experiența unui veritabil membru al American Antiquarian Society, dar și cu flerul unui condei adesea exersat in the New York Times. I had written an earlier novel called The Beautiful American about uh, an American photographer, Lee Miller, who had be began her working life as a Vogue model and became Man Ray's mistress and then became a photographer, a very well-known artist in her own right. But because of her connection to the fashion industry as a model, I was involved in this research in Paris fashion before and during World War II. And I just found it really fascinating because quite honestly, I hadn't thought before about the connection between fashion and politics. And once you see the connection, you see it everywhere. So I wanted to write about two very powerful women and how their chosen arts or professions were so involved with the politics of the time they became inseparable why do you think fashion couture is such a, a passion and rivalry filled domain it's it's partially personality driven like many arts where you can have the skill you can have the genius but if you can't put it out into a larger world with a big following you probably aren't going to go very far and coco chanel and elsie scopriarelli were both huge huge egos you know larger than life no looking back no checking over their shoulder just plowing forward and the industry itself i think tends to be like that like many arts i mean you think of art in the 60s in america who springs to mind andy warhol who is this huge huge presence culturally and so much so that in a way his cultural presence began to override his art in its own and fashion i think is very much like that it also involves you know people's sense of identity we wear clothes and and it, it identifies as even more than the things on our shelf because this is what we're showing to the world and the world is is not in here looking at shelves so there's so much involved with identity and what we want the world to see and what we want the world to know about us it is not only this rivalry between chanel and schiaparelli that you describe in your book uh, it's uh, Paris in itself, uh, like this magnetic city uh, at the dawn of the of the World War II. And um, I was wondering what makes and what made Paris the center of the world in that time. Because uh, if we look around and uh, it just uh, we just have to read your book, we're about to see that everyone and everything is happening there in Paris. It's not London, it's not even New York, it is Paris. Why? That's an excellent question, isn't it? I mean, every artist in the world who wanted to create a reputation went to Paris. Uh, and, you know, I think it began after World War I, when many Americans traveled abroad for the first time, they didn't want to go back home. And it was cheaper in France uh, than in this country. It was more bohemian. We still had a lot of the, the Puritan tendencies in our culture. And, you know, even with prohibition, some people went to France because they could have a glass of wine with dinner. Um, but I think it was the energy. There was something about the energy of Paris at the time. And it kind of reminds me of New York in the 60s, which had that same kind of renaissance, that same kind of energy of, of young, no matter what age you were, young, uh, creative, artistic, determined to, to fill the space with, with your creation. And, just the energy in all of the arts, just amazing, isn't it? Uh, this clash between uh, Chanel and Schiaparelli could also be seen as a clash between two cultural archetypes. 
Absolutely. Uh, and to political archetypes, too, because uh, Coco Chanel was what we today would call a right wing conservative. And Elsa Scapirelli was very much left wing, what we would call a communist sympathizer. Right. And, and the politics of the times, in a way, it's similar to now, which frightens me a little bit, but everything was so polarized that there was the right and the left and very little in between. Apart uh, its uh, bankruptcy in 1954, why do you think uh, the house of Schiaparelli did not make it uh, until today, uh, apart as being uh, something that we would call today an historical artifact? The house of Schiaparelli did not have the kind of financial backing that uh, Chanel developed with, with some very wealthy families, so that when um, Scapirelli was on the verge of bankruptcy after the war, there was no big um, financial institution to bail her out. Uh, she was on her own financially. And, and, and historians say, well, her, her, her style, her flamboyance didn't translate into the post-war years. And that's partially true. I think after World War II, people became a little more serious. Things were a little harder. Um, rationing, uh, not as much money, trying to find jobs. And her, the playfulness of her designs didn't carry over the way some of Chanel did with her very business-like suits that could be worn everywhere, that little black dress that could be worn everywhere. Uh, I think Scapirelli's just wasn't as flexible as Chanel's. But I want to point out, and this, this makes me so happy, when President Biden was inaugurated, and there were two performers, Lady Gaga and Jennifer Lopez, right? Jennifer Lopez wore Chanel, Lady Gaga wore Scapirelli. <laughs> I was wondering, uh, had it not been her controversial link with the Nazi influentia uh, during World War II, uh, would Coco have had a similar end as Schiaparelli's? I don't think so because of the money behind the House of Chanel. Uh, it's worth trillions of dollars. And even after the war, it was still worth a tremendous amount of money. And, and there were there were backers. An Italian group uh, decided to revive the name and we're about to see uh, how this transition is going to happen uh, for the next years because the tradition exists. The name uh, we have to raise up to is really an important one. Now we, can, we have to see uh, the metamorphosis uh, linked to this particular time and to the taste of this time. Absolutely. You know, when I was working on this book and talking occasionally to friends and other people about it, so few people had actually heard of Elsa Scapirelli. And it, it, it actually kind of shocked me because 
her name had always kind of been a part of my life. I remember being a teenage girl and having a newsprint blouse on it, which was one of the things that Elsa Scoparelli invented, of course. Mine was a knockoff, of course. <laughs> but, <laughs> um, yeah, we need to get her name out there. I mean, she was such an artist. Yes, yes, she was. And, and it's funny that um, not even um, her secondary lines, which is the perfumes, the accessories, they did not make it until today. If we think of an iconic perfume, uh, which was shocking, right? 1928, probably uh, her uh, best known perfume uh, to date. It didn't make it. Chanel 5, it did. Yeah. Uh... In some ways, Coco Chanel was just such a better business person. The, the shocking perfume, uh, that silhouette is based on Mae West. Body. Exactly, exactly. It and, it's so been, and it's been replicated by Jean-Paul Gaultier in the early 90s with his, yes. uh, with his uh, uh, flask of, uh, yes. of perfume. Yes. Now, uh, Coco died in 1971. Uh, it is in 1983 that Karl Lagerfeld became the chief designer of Chanel. And so we see even in the Chanel case, we have this 12 years gap uh, when we have basically nobody of their prominence, of their, of their status to lead the house. Well, in spite of this, the house not only survived, but it, it flourished uh, even more. How do you explain that? There were a couple of items that, that Chanel uh, put on the market that became so iconic. Uh, the purse, the little quilted purse. Yes. Uh, as you say, the perfume, the tweed suits that uh, look, they looked in the 70s a little too ladylike for many people, but were actually very versatile. You could wear that jacket with jeans, uh, it looked great. Would you say that uh, Schiaparelli was more uh, couture-oriented uh, instead of Chanel, uh, who at a certain point um, concentrated more on pret a porter I, I think, I would say that. I mean, Elsa Scapirelli actually, I think even before Chanel, created a ready-to-wear for uh, department stores. Bonwit Teller in New York had ready-to-wear. Uh, from Scapirelli. And in a way, Scapirelli hampered herself by allowing all sorts of knockoffs. She was very flattered when people imitated her. She did not protect her work the way Coco Chanel did. So that there was there were like imitation Scapirellis that really did compete with the real thing. And that I think that harmed her a lot. You know, when Coco Chanel was uh, having her collections shown in Paris, she would not let people bring pencils and paper in for fear that they would take notes. And uh, Scapirelli, on the other hand, said, oh, let them copy, I'm flattered. Well, you put much emphasis on primary colors in your book. Basically, um, all the book's parts are defined by one primary color. And I was wondering, since obviously Schiaparelli was the color and Chanel was the contrast between non-colors, which is black and white, which is the importance that you give to this uh, to this message transmitted by the color. Color fascinates me. Uh, yeah. I am I am a verbal person, not really a visual one. So I am constantly challenging my perception of the world and how it appears on the page. I mean, for instance, when I was working on a novel, I gave a small section of it to my husband to read. And he said, you know, Jeannie, there's not a single color here. And, and I realized, oh yes, well, you have to account for the colors in the world as well. It's not just black and white on the page. And my father was colorblind. So I've always tried to imagine what is it like to actually not even see color. So color fascinates me and, and our relationship to color. 
uh, what it does to us. For instance, I'm wearing black because I'm actually a very shy person. I do not wear shocking pink. <laughs> black works for me. Um, I am. <laughs> <laughs> if you were to define both couturiers with just one word for each of them, what would your choice be? Uh, for Elsa Scarpirelli, it would be playful. And for Coco Chanel, it would be wearable. The last question, maybe a trickier one. What Chanel piece uh, would you match with the Schiaparelli one? Uh, the, the Chanel, no, that's a good question. So the, the, the Chanel piece she would have worn would have been a little day suit, very practical little day suit. I, I think the Schiaparelli piece would have been the cloak embroidered with the zodiac, uh, with the sequins and the velvet. The one that Lady Manda wore that probably mm -hmm. weighed about 40 pounds, right? Hard to wear on a little woman. It's been a pleasure, Jean. Thank you so, so very much. Thank you, Marius. Tot astăzi, la ediție limitată, îl cunoaștem pe Roberto Civeta, unul dintre cei mai importanți restauratori și autori de texte despre restaurare pe care Italia îi are în acest moment. Roberto Civeta este diplomat în istoria artei și în restaurare la Institutul Silvio D'Amico din Roma, iar în anul 2012 a primit premiul Personalitatea Europeană a Anului chiar la Capitoliu. În prezent, Roberto Civeta este angajat pentru a asigura procesul de restaurare al unora dintre cele mai importante opere prezente în expozițiile organizate în Italia și în străinătate când vine vorba de artă antică și de artă medievală și renascentistă. E un piacere per me eh, parlare un po' eh, di un tema che non ho toccato finora nel mio show, cioè il restauro d'arte. Eh, eh, la prima domanda è veramente questa, una propria curiosità. Quanto è arte e quanto è tecnica in un tale processo? Bene, allora diciamo che il, il restauro in Italia parte da fonti antiche come diciamo nel resto del mondo, ma specialmente in Grecia. Diciamo che per rispondere alla domanda inizialmente direi che è un, è un fatto tecnico. Allora, mh, per quanto riguarda le, le mostre, eh, le opere d'arte che vengono esposte temporaneamente all'interno di un'esposizione, e la figura del restauratore interviene laddove appunto c'è l'esigenza di valutare lo stato di conservazione dell'opera quindi in realtà il restauratore arriva eh, quando le opere arrivano al museo mm -hmm. che, deve, che deve appunto ospitare queste opere e c'è una si redige una, una schema che si chiama condition report dove vengono descritte eh, nello specifico tutti, tutti i fenomeni di degrado a seconda ovviamente del materiale, eh, del materiale se, se è una scultura, se è un dipinto, a seconda di quel materiale vengono inserite alcune voci e vengono, viene studiato proprio lo stato di conservazione dell'opera che viene descri descritto in queste schede. Parlavi di questo argomento, di questo tipo di ambiente museistico eh, adatto alla lunga conservazione di una opera d'arte. Di che tipo di ambiente ha bisogno, diciamo, un quadro del Rinascimento per essere apprezzato a lungo senza danneggiarlo perché sappiamo che eh, il più grande danneggio viene proprio dai visitatori del museo ma non toccando l'opera naturalmente alla conservazione preventiva al controllo microclimatico del museo perché c'è la, non solo l'ambiente la, diciamo, dove viene destinato e la, la, insomma dove appunto ci sono i parametri di temperatura, umidità relativa ma ci sono anche le radiazioni elettromagnetiche la qualità dell'aria all'interno dei macroambienti delle sale espositive se poi pensiamo ai depositi anche lì ci sono oppure dei microambienti dove ci sono questi contenitori museali anche all'interno delle vetrine eh, dove vengono esposte le opere tutto deve essere calcolato Ovviamente ci sono delle tabelle di riferimento, anche degli standard che fanno proprio riferimento al quantitativo, al numero delle persone che visitano 
eh, che visitano gli ambienti. Ad esempio mi viene in mente che per la Cappella Sistina c'è stato tutto uno studio, innanzitutto insomma, ehm, negli ultimi anni, per cui è, sono state cambiate, è stato cambiato proprio l'assetto e l'illuminazione, la, è stato studiato nuovamente eh, tutto l'aspetto termo-igrometrico e per, proprio anche in funzione del cambio del numero maggiore di visitatori rispetto a quello di un ventennio precedente. Però ci sono anche altri fattori che possono essere proprio causati dall'agente umano che è per esempio un atto vandalico, un furto, sì, uno sì. spostamento illecito, insomma, eh, oppure mh, addirittura pensiamo che sia una, un museo che ha un'opera esposta vicino, proprio su, vicino a una strada ad alto rischio, ad alto traffico, i movimenti che la struttura edilizia può appunto può sostenere quindi ehm, è veramente importante riuscire a studiare a conoscere bene l'ambiente in cui viene esposto e bisogna monitorarlo per tutto il tempo dell'esposizione in questo caso temporanea di un'opera che viene prestata a una mostra Roberto, dimmi quali, quali sono i più importanti progetti che hanno beneficiato della tua esperienza? Eh, ho una certa età e quindi diciamo che... Ma non si vede, non ti preoccupare <ride> perché non si vede questa età. Grazie, grazie, molto gentile. Però eh, allora diciamo che dal 2006-2007 al 2010 mi sono occupato del restauro della Basilica, di una parte della Basilica di San Pietro e quindi dal congiungimento con la facciata fino all'abside del transetto di Michelangelo, all'inizio dell'abside, in questi quattro anni, ho eseguito questo lavoro della, della facciata, del laterale della facciata esterna del prospetto sud. E a, a, diciamo, nello Stato Vaticano ho anche restaurato la parete di controfacciata in stucchi dorati, le finestre della navata centrale, una chiesa che è all'interno dello Stato. Poi ho fatto, attualmente sono al Colosseo, al restauro della Galleria Intermedia al Colosseo, ma nel, me, nel mentre ci sono tantissimi lavori, anche come dire, poco noti, che però a me sono, non, sono molto cari, mm -hmm. perché mh, questa professione ti mette davanti, a, 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 è, è una parte della vita, non, non scingo lavoro, a, lavoro, vita privata, insomma alla fine è un unicum per cui ti trovi continuamente a, ad, avere, a, a, ad, ad incontrare sia in Italia che all'estero persone sempre diverse, quindi hai dei tratti della vita, dei momenti di vita vissuta che ti rimangono sempre impressi. Poi non lo so, nel 2012 sono stato insignito del premio Personalità Europea dell'anno al Campidoglio dal Presidente dal Centro Europeo per la Cultura, il Turismo e lo Spettacolo. E, e poi insomma di lavori ne ho tantissimi e questo, tutti i lavori che faccio devo dire devo proprio ringraziare il mio team, la mia squadra, i, i restauratori e le restauratrici, i tecnici, gli architetti che fanno parte della mia società, mia sorella in primis che è la restauratrice anche lei, eh, che appunto mi aiutano e mi supportano in tutto insomma. Ecco. Hai dei campi favoriti nel restauro? Allora, per quanto mi riguarda mi occupo di materiali lapidei e derivati, tutto ciò che è in architettura, in scultura, stucchi, affreschi, mosaici, ecco questo è proprio il mio settore, però il mio team è abbastanza completo perché abbiamo insomma anche gli altri materiali. Una domanda forse un po' inaspettata, qual è la più importante errore che un restauratore può fare? Beh, quello di non valutare che, che, che cosa ha di fronte, che tipo di opera adatta ha di fronte, se non si prepara bene, se non studia bene l'opera, se non conosce l'aspetto la, storico-artistico, l'aspetto chimico, vengono, considera che spesso prima di mettere come dire, fisicamente le mani su un'opera c'è la possibilità di, di avere tantissime risposte eh, che possono essere eh, come dire, delle, delle indagini di laboratorio non distruttive, ci sono degli studi grazie anche alla fotografia, alla radiografia, che ti possono raccontare cosa c'è dietro, dentro l'opera, dietro l'opera c'è cioè quello che tu non riesci a, a cogliere visivamente. Quali sarebbero le mostre internazionali che ti hanno lasciato un'impressione indimenticabile negli ultimi anni? Ok, allora intanto ti ringrazio. E... 
e ricordo a te, ricordo anche a me che da circa un anno ho iniziato a scrivere anche per una rivista alla quale sono molto legato che si chiama Art of Part of Culture, Remove the Background Noise che è costituita insomma da tre donne che stimo moltissimo e che mi hanno dato questa grande opportunità di scrivere con loro e di poter, eh, come dire, condividere eh, ciò che più mi interessa che è la conservazione dei beni culturali mm -hmm. perché sono certo che la memoria la memoria di ciò che è nell'archeologia, che è nella cultura dei popoli, non sono italiano, che ovviamente l'Italia, sai, <ride> non è necessario dirlo, è il paese che ospita e che trattiene, che tiene il maggior quantitativo e qualitativo delle opere d'arte del patrimonio mondiale. Però allo stesso tempo ehm, ricordo anche a me stesso che il valore della cultura, della memoria che passa attraverso l'arte è ciò che fa dei popoli, anche quelli più lontani da noi o poco conosciuti, ne mantiene l'esistenza. Quindi, per quanto riguarda le mostre, mi viene in mente di dire che mi, mi sono sempre piaciute perché spesso ho, ho l'occasione di poter scegliere eh, a quali lavori poter indirizzare il mio tempo, anche se sono come dire, una persona che cerca di, 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 di poter contribuire per quanto posso, io possa fare a tutto ciò che mi, mi viene incontro. C'è una mostra in particolare che con il gruppo Artemisia si tratta di, ehm, ho collaborato con loro, ehm, con il presidente Iole Siena, che praticamente è stata Pollock, la scuola di New York che con il Whitney Museum ho avuto l'occasione di approfondire questo, quel periodo che va insomma negli anni 50, metà del, del Novecento americano e che ha fatto sì che eh, gli artisti americani fossero presi poi in considerazione perché fino a poco prima venivano, mh, erano presi in considerazione soltanto gli artisti europei. Quindi un po' questo momento che segna questo passaggio mi ha incuriosito molto e vedere quelle opere che normalmente non vedo, non sono abituato a vedere, eh, mi hanno veramente appassionato. Il tuo discorso eh, sopra l'arte in genere eh, ha questa caratteristica di essere allo stesso tempo accessibile e molto molto eh, profondo in ciò che riguarda il valore eh, delle informazioni. Per me è un grande piacere eh, parlare con te oggi e ti ringrazio tantissimo per questa occasione. Grazie Roberto. Guarda, sono io che ringrazio te, è davvero un'esperienza molto bella, molto interessante, quindi ti ringrazio moltissimo. Doamnelor, domnilor, edizia limitata de astăzi se închide aici. Sunt Marius Constantinescu, citiți nelimitat.